Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the inaugural DSL Harbinger Lecture, Europe's Digital Future Challenges of the Digital Services Act, featuring guest speaker Dr. Martin Husevets, Assistant Professor at the London School of Economics, hosted by Dr. Joseph Michael Mintal from Mate Bell University. To speak to uh, speak to you and, and, and your students. Um, I, I, I previously told uh, uh, told you that um, I had a chance. Uh, actually, so I or, I originally come from uh, Central Slovakia, so I was born uh, nearby Kremnica. So um, it's a region that is very close to my heart, and uh, it's a it's a great pity that we're not able to see each other in person. Uh, so hopefully next time, uh, you know, this will be possible actually in the offline uh, offline space. So. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the, the Europe's digital future. You know, uh, um, pretty uh, pretty significant uh, issue of today, and particularly, I'd like to look at how the EU is trying to approach this, and why perhaps the EU is the is is the right institution um, to to approach this. Okay, so let me see. All right, so you're all familiar, and you've all had a chance to read in the media about all kinds of things. Uh, going on in the online space. And one of the things that perhaps recently sort of uh, resonated a lot was when Twitter decided to ban Trump and many political reader leaders around the world decided to, um, well, either support that question, that decision of Twitter. I guess the important point for many was to realize that these platforms actually have a power to um, to uh, suspend an account that is so instrumental for a sitting president. Um, so at the center of this debate um, were these companies, uh, companies to which or services of which we uh, often refer to as platforms and, and, and companies like Airbnb, uh, Twitter, um, YouTube, etc. Now, what is special about these companies? Uh, why are these companies so um, at the front and center of our current discourse? Well, obviously, uh, sort of the first cynic reason would be to look at um, look at their um, their uh, market uh, capitalization and realize that actually they're so valuable that if you take market capitalization of some of these companies and try to sort of uh, compare it with the GDP of uh, some of uh, big European um, uh, countries, you realize that actually uh, United Kingdom uh, has an annual GDP that just equals to the market capitalization of Amazon, Microsoft and Apple. And just to realize that um, GDP is a collection of all the products and services being sold in the country over the years. So that's pretty significant uh, when Switzerland is basically um, uh, the Switzerland's annual GDP is as big as Microsoft. And I mean, thinking about this, obviously, from Slovak perspective, if you think about the market capitalization of Apple, that's basically 20, 20 times the Slovak GDP. Uh, from 2019. So it's just massive. And also when you look at the index funds and generally the public markets, you can see that um, the concentration of capital is just is just tremendous. Now, what is really interesting about this is that um, if you think about the history, Internet was actually at a very early days, um, this sort of a success of this intermediation. So it was celebrated as a for its decentralized character. So the fact that now suddenly everyone can come online without seeking permission from anyone and can suddenly publish blogs, you know, and all kinds of other content uh, without seeking sort of approval of some publishers or that you could sell to other people without going through sort of the typical chain of suppliers. Um, but that uh, this intermediation story um, as it seems was rather short lived because what we see now is a new group of um, uh, intermediaries uh, platforms that are basically um, uh, sort of in between uh, what we would normally um, normally do with offline intermediaries. Now we're doing with online intermediaries, perhaps fewer, but with, even with more concentration and with players that are much more global. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because if you think about this, since we're all moving to the digital space, um, uh, these companies are powering to great extent the digital infrastructure that powers the economy and society. So it represents not only large um, amount of public markets and also the, the part of the global GDP, but they also build and operate uh, our semi-public spaces. So what normally would be a square is today uh, a large platform. Just think about a pandemic and how 
uh, a social unrest and protest is happening actually in these spaces as opposed to in the streets. Um, so it's very critical how these places are governed because of the democratic processes, um, such as elections, but also because of, um, uh, you know, generally uh, what, what you're reading is just influenced very much by what these companies um, allow you to see. So what has been the EU's approach in regulating this so far? Well, actually, so far we haven't done too much. Um, so we had this liability framework that tried to sort of uh, regulate under which conditions these companies might be liable. And then we had a general purpose competition law trying to sort of in some cases intervene, you know, against Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, tackling all kinds of issues. So our approach hasn't been really tackling what appears to be the main problem. And that problem was sort of nicely summarized by uh, Commissioner Vestager, who's, who basically is a very uh, enthusiastic um, sort of proponent of, of digitization and digital revolution, but um, she has this sort of Danish twist uh, to it where she says, well, um, we are definitely interested in digital revolution, but we want it also to be democratic revolution, uh, meaning that uh, any revolution should put the needs of Europeans first. So any economy that results from this should be a fair economy. Any jobs resulting from this should be good jobs, not just any jobs. So um, so this is how we end up here uh, today, 2000 and well, the end of 2020 and essentially 2021 um, is a year when we'll be debating how to approach this as Europeans. Um, and the two main initiatives uh, tackling this problem um, of platforms that I'll try to explain in a second what those um, are, are DSA and DMA. Um, so DSA is a Digital Services Act, and that's an act that will be dealing mostly with liability for users' content. Uh, we'll be dealing with issues how to enforce uh, rules in the online space, you know, how to remove hate speech, how to remove copyright infringing material, etc. And transparency, the fact that uh, platforms actually explain to us what they are doing. Then Digital Markets Act, DMA, is an act that deals with special obligations that we want to impose on big players, big platforms, with the idea that um, we understand that the market is concentrated um, and we want to sort of um, in the long run prevent that. And uh, we want to prevent that through two basic tools, basically improving contestability of the markets. Basically, we're trying to make it more possible for new entrants to enter the market. Um, and, uh, and second, we want to improve the fairness of, of competition in the online space. So <clears throat> I know that this can be sometimes very, uh, very abstract. Um, when you think about all kinds of uh, platforms, just, just to give you sort of a very quick overview of what kind of platforms will, will be regulated. Um, you can think about, you know, um, transaction platforms like Amazon and Apple, they will be regulated by both of these acts. Google and Bing will be regulated by DMA, not DSA. Facebook and similar social networks will be definitely regulated if they fulfill certain thresholds. YouTube, TikTok, Twitch, you know, all kinds of services that you can see here will be uh, will be regulated. So it's a really, really large set of players. Obviously, I cannot discuss all of the issues that are arising in this space. So I'd like to focus on two, two challenges. First, I'd like to focus on systemic issues, um, particularly the problem which might be interesting to you. This is why I present this one is the problem of amplification of sort of attention grabbing content, very often extremist content. And second, uh, sort of problem of manipulation of discourse. So, um, so that's one set of issues. And second, I would like to also show quickly the problem of quality of decisions that these platforms are making when they're trying to enforce uh, the laws, like, uh, for instance, in the area of hate speech. So let's start. Systemic issues. So let me start with a small story that just my wife told me the other day. I quit Facebook a couple of, well, uh, a year ago, uh, but uh, she's sort of an avid user uh, because of all the places where you can buy stuff for kids. Um, and she told me this story where basically um, there was this user on one of those, one of these Facebook groups um, who was uh, trying to sell stuff and apparently the ad had no traction. So no one was interested in whatever the person was selling. So then this user observed that when people um, advertise something and they make many mistakes in Slovak grammar that likely attracts other people 
to comment on the grammar, not necessarily on the offer, right? So the user thought, well, I could use this to write my advert in a totally ridiculous Slovak with many mistakes that will be just jarring. And that will attract many people to complain about this, trying to correct my mistakes, and they will just improve my visibility, right? And in this, this, this is exactly what happened. So the person wrote this ad, making every possible mistake you can think of, just really sort of uh, pushing the ad up in the in the Facebook feed, and you know, uh, making it a story of the day in that group. Uh, and obviously, many people saw the ad. So, what's the takeaway from this? Well, the takeaway of, from this is that um, is the reason why, obviously, uh, this posts and uh, end up being so heavily promoted is because of the interactions. And the assumption behind the algorithm is that interactions are good because that means that that the uh, that a content is something that is uh, well desirable for other people to see. Well, as you can see in this uh, very small example, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, and and what you can see with this um, is that uh, the setup of these platforms matters a lot for the experience that you're getting because the more people realize this, the more people start using it. And the same goes for the entire setup of these platforms, because the, if the main income, source of income is advertising, then uh, what you try to do as a platform, you try to maximize the time that people spend on the platform. Well, if you try to maximize the time that they spend on the platform, you need to go into the dark places because people actually like to do things that are not always just pleasant. So if their time uh, that are willing to devote something is strongly linked to outrage because they like to read about something that makes them, you know, partly unhappy, partly amused. Well, then you will be selling outrage at the end of the day. Um, and that's obviously a possibility, but then the re end result of this that your platform ends up being a sort of outrage machine. So you can't generate attention. Uh, but and, and it, it's maybe not necessarily destroying your product, but it's not necessarily also good from the societal's perspective. Another example is YouTube recommendation algorithm. And this is, I highly recommend if you haven't seen this, New York Times has this really interesting rabbit hole podcast where they're sort of uh, um, um, uh, tracking one guy who basically um, uh, spends most of his life on YouTube really and is slowly driven from the center, so from the center of uh, political universe when it comes to content, to extremist and sort of right-wing stuff through all kinds of things that he watches and that YouTube step-by-step -step recommends to him. So and the argument against a sort of YouTube's um, a recommendation algorithm is that it drives polarization. And then there are some studies suggesting that there's a strong evidence that it, indeed YouTube um, algorithm actually radicalizes. There's some there are some studies that are also being criticized um, which claim the opposite. The the point is not necessarily to say what a YouTube specific algorithm is 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 doing that at a moment. The point is to say that algorithm can do that. It's an empirical question which algorithm does that. But the point is if the algorithm can do that, what should be our response to tackle this? Should we leave it to the platforms to solve it as their product issue? Um, or is this something we want to regulate in the law? And the response to that in the DSA is, well, if it's a very large platform, very large online platform, something we call VLOP, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible uh, abbreviation, uh, then you will have a special duty, that's the proposal, to assess the systemic risks that your platform is posing. And if you find those risks, and we'll look in a, in, a, in, a, in a second what kind of risk, what other risks that could be, um, then you need to take reasonable proportion and effective mitigation measures that are tailored to that specific risk. Um, so what would that mean specifically in our two examples? That would mean that you review your algorithm, look at how it's driving certain bad outcomes, and, and try to minimize those, right? Um, perhaps while keeping uh, in mind your product. And this is then informs, uh, sort of uh, enforced through um, sort of uh, other obligations to self audit yourself and then sort of present that audit to the authorities, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other thing that the DSA tries to do is to try to increase transparency, including transparency of these recommendation algorithms. And this is really interesting. It tries to force companies 
to allow users to cust to be able to customize their um, sort of recommendation engines. So if YouTube is recommending you something um, that you do not appreciate, you should actually be in a position to customize that recommendation engine uh, to your needs. Okay, so that's one type of system is risks. What other types of system is risks would we actually see? Well, the second big sort of bucket of issues is manipulation, particularly manipulation of the discourse with the spillover to the election, uh, uh, to the electoral processes and 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 related uh, kind of democratic processes. So the big a lot of work on this um, in this space was done by by this guy. Uh, Professor Howard from from Oxford University, who has an ERC grant um, in this space and has been really sort of uh, building up a lot of capability. And this work started around a time when uh, people realized that uh, U.S. elections in 2016 weren't as fair as you would think, because actually a lot of content that people uh, saw on the Internet wasn't real. Uh, it wasn't real in the sense that it wasn't actually produced by humans, but it was largely pre pre uh, produced by bots. So actually machines, pieces of code that, are, that basically argued with each other or argued with other humans. Now, why is that something useful? Well, it's useful because if you have a discourse where humans are debating with other machines or machines are debating among themselves, then humans that watch them can have an impression of what the public space looks like, right? In the same way as if you read newspaper, you have a certain impression of what the general opinion is, although that might be false. Um, but in a similar way, um, Vuli and his co-author argue that basically these kind of techniques allow you to manipulate uh, the perception of, of reality and what the discourse is into perhaps thinking that there is a false consensus or perhaps that there is a that, a, that the minority of um, that, that a certain group is actually much larger than you would you would have thought that a, you would have thought that anti-vaxxers are a minority but then you open up your Twitter and suddenly there are a majority of your uh, of your feet so um, so they argue that what the, uh, many of these techniques try to do is to sort of manufacture consensus sort of illusion of popularity of of something, you know, whether that's a candidate or of some solution or of some hoax or something else. Um, and they sort of show the implications of that. Um, now, the legal challenge here is that that per se is not always illegal. Um, it's a propaganda, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's illegal because not all information, misinformation is illegal. In fact, this is one of the big issues with misinformation is that yes, information can be incorrect, but it doesn't make it necessarily unlawful. Um, so um, the the other problem with this is that you cannot fight a, a machine with machine so easily because it's very hard to automate these sort of things. Um, it's sometimes easier to act upon metadata, observing that someone is uh, is a bot as opposed to uh, trying to actually understand what the person is saying because in this space context is everything. So if you think about um, tweet like this, obviously it's meant to be ironic, but uh, the machine would you could easily uh, interpret this as a misinformation, right? This was a reaction of the prime minister, Slovak prime minister to um, to the mass testing um, in full. So um, last but not least, the third set of systemic risks that a DSA tries to tackle on platforms is the problem of dissemination of illegal content. And here you can think about hate speech, copyright infringing material and, and similar type of stuff, uh, terrorist propaganda and similar things. Now, DSA here takes uh, sort of several approaches. First, it tries to facilitate removal of content by specifying how the process works. Second, it tries to create a mechanism for follow on investigation. So you can actually investigate who those people are who are spreading, uh, say, hate speech. And finally, again, it tries to impose certain risk mitigation obligations on these large platforms so that they sort of de-risk uh, their platforms uh, um, and, and, and they're less biased towards, say, promoting hate speech. So for, perhaps before I sort of tell you a little bit about the response, I need to tell you how it actually works today. Well, the way it works, and I'm using a framing from copyright law, but the same would apply for hate speech. 
you would have um, you would have uh, someone who complains. So in copyright law, that's a right holder, Walt Disney, or it could be an NGO that is trying to uh, remove stuff that um, that contains hate speech. That would notify a provider, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Um, and that provider then would be under obligation to remove the content because if they don't, they could be liable along with the user who originally posted this content. And then this content is removed and the affected user exposed usually can complain. Now, the problem is that there is so much stuff out there that whatever domain you pick, uh, very often notification is actually not, by done, not done by human, it's done by bots. Um, assessment uh, on these platforms is partly done by by bots, partly done by humans. So you end up with the problem of quality of decisions. So the very fact that you have this process is nice, but if the input to the process is problematic because people over notify stuff that it's not hate speech or copyright infringement, and these platforms over comply because they don't properly assess whatever is notified to them, then they take down even stuff that is perfectly lawful is just happen to be notified. And finally, because the affected users don't necessarily complain, the end result of this that basically you're removing systematically content that is perfectly lawful, perhaps objectionable to some people, but lawful and is just removed because of the bad setup. So you have a lot of false positives in the system and the question becomes what to do about that. So here the DSA basically takes the approach of, okay, we need to distinguish. How big a uh, player are we talking about? So if we're talking about player like YouTube or Facebook, you're a very large platform, and then you're under obligation to take certain risk mitigation measures, be transparent about what you're doing, etc. If you are other than very large player, then you should have other obligations, sort of a baseline obligations to provide a good process for removal of content. So for instance, uh, according to the new rules, there should be clear procedures or clear, clear, clear requirements for the internal complaint mechanism. So how Facebook and YouTube are, or even smaller platforms, um, are actually dealing with complaints that they receive from users. That they have to process these not only out uh, through automated means, but that they actually have humans and they need to inform parties in timely and diligent manner at, and similar sort of things. And, and most importantly, perhaps, and this is, this is what I've done a lot of work, is they have to always uh, allow that affected parties can complain to external bodies, alternative dispute resolution bodies, where basically you can complain and if they make a decision that the decision is binding on the platform, even if platform doesn't like the outcome, and on top, the platform has to compensate for the cost of your complaint. So if you have paid, I don't know, 50 euros to be able to access that ADR, then Facebook has to pay that money to you or to the platform, whoever uh, uh, paid the cost. So I guess the overarching question, I'm sort of marching towards the end, overarching question of this is, well, does it solve the problem of power that I started with? So we said there's a lot of market concentration, which uh, attracts a lot of power. And, uh, and does it really solve the problem of power? Well, not entirely. Why is that? Well, um, DSA basically tries to curtail power, but only through procedural means, you could say. It tries to impose transparency. It tries to impose uh, issues like uh, fair trial obligations, remedies uh, to the process, so you can actually have a credible remedy that your content is reinstated, but it doesn't fully resolve the problem of power, and that is the fact that a platform, if the content is lawful, still has a possibility to formulate its own policies for what it wants to carry or not. So think about this. If you come back here, if this problem of uh, limiting Donald Trump's Twitter account is a problem of enforcing hate speech, then that's, uh, that's something that uh, Facebook doesn't have or Twitter doesn't have too much power over because the law would prescribe that it's hate speech and that it needs to be blocked. Not necessarily that the account has to be blocked, but that that the content that is hate speech needs to be blocked. Now the problem, the first problem is obviously that the US has a very different standard of what is hate speech compared to Europe. Um, but second problem is that many of these things and these decisions will be in the space where something is actually not unlawful but it's just not desirable for the platform. 
So from that perspective, for instance, good example here is if Facebook decides, as it did, to limit pictures that include nipples, then that is a decision that you do not change anyhow. Because if they formulated a policy as saying, well, lawful content, nude pictures with nipples, is something we don't want on our platform, then the DSA doesn't give you really a solution to that. So that part of power stays. Now, with the power that you re re remove or curtail is the power of making decisions because you basically discipline them through transparency, fair trial, and remedies. Okay, so what it means in total is that um, the takeaway of this is that yes, you're curtailing the power through DSA um, in an important way uh, with a really, I think, forward looking measures, but it doesn't reduce the problem that that power still exists. And the problem of, of the power still existing is that, as ordo liberals would tell us, the economic power translates into political power over time, right? We can see that, right? Just look at the number of um, paid lobbies in Brussels and US. You can see that the tech companies are very successful, increasingly so. So uh, the other fragment of the European's policy, the DMA, Digital Markets Act, is equally important because to properly discipline the power that they have, even over social discourse and similar things, you need to make the markets contestable. You need to allow the new entrants enter because only then uh, Facebook thinks whether it maybe disenfranchises too many people by for, for forbidding uh, nipples on its platform. Obviously, nipple seems like a trivial example, but there are many others where you could have um, similar considerations. So if you want to have a, a check on power, you need to have contestability of markets and you need to have fairness. And you can only do that with competitive pressure. So you need to have regulation that tries to improve the contestability um, and, and tries to open up uh, the markets because only the markets in that sense with smart regulation can be a sufficient check on that power. Okay, and with this I end.